Alright, what is you want? Good morning everybody. Um, I'm Blaine and this is Josh. And we're going to be talking about the Flareon Challenge and different concepts uh, that we learned and we want to share with everybody. So, my name is Josh. I currently work as a security researcher for Endgame. Um, I'm primarily interested in binary exploitation and vulnerability research. And in my free time, I like to play a lot of CTFs. And I'm Blaine. Uh, I work in the game as well. I'm a malware researcher. I'm uh, part of the R&D team. I really enjoy taking apart malware, especially malware that tends to give me a hard time when you're taking apart uh, whatever it uses, like a assembly or, or, or application. Uh, here's a brief rundown of the agenda we'll have for today. Uh, we have a lot of slides, so uh, we might be moving at a slightly different pace. Uh, we're going to quickly go over flare on, uh, what it is, and various CPS. A quick introduction to virtual engineering if you're not very familiar with it. And then we're going to dive into some of the actual concepts that we pulled out of the, the, the challenge that we think are great to share and connect with. So, so why do a, a CTF or reverse engineering uh, challenge? Well, they expose you to a lot of new old and or new concepts and old concepts, and they're also great to help you uh, test your skills as well as keep them home. Um, so, for like one, for example, one of the reasons I wanted to do the challenge was I, I had done reverse engineering for like over six months, and I wanted to see uh, I'm still good at it. How do I stack up compared to others? Uh, so, obviously, you can also get some street cred from your, your fellow peers and then some, some flair. <laughs> Pass up to Josh. So, uh, obviously this talk is about the Flareon Challenge, which is an annual challenge hosted by FireEye's Flare team, which focuses on key reverse engineering concepts, many of which are actually employed by real-world malware. And so, each Flareon Challenge is actually composed of several different levels, each increasing in difficulty. So, level one would be the easiest, and the last level would be the most difficult. Um, this year there were ten levels, um, again, each increasing in difficulty, and uh, per tradition, as a reward for completing the challenge, FireEye typically gives out a prize to all the winners at the conclusion of the contest. Uh, the first year that, Flare, that the Flareon Challenge was held, the winners got a challenge coin. The second year, they got a belt buckle, and this year's prize is this neat looking badge, which uh, is supposed to be shipped by the end of this month. So. This challenge actually started in 2014, and um, it's been going on every year since then. And this year, there were actually uh, 124 finishers out of 2,063 participants, and 17 of those finishers were from the U.S., which included uh, me and Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a brief overview uh, of the challenges going down the left and different concepts that we extracted and or were expressed throughout the challenge that we, uh, we, we wanted to highlight. Uh, we're not going to be going over all of the different concepts today. Uh, most of the talk will focus on more of the ones on the, the left-hand side, but this just kind of gives you a, a general feel for some of the things the challenge expressed and uh, what made it more difficult. All right, so a basic overview of Flare and challenge. And now we're going to dive into uh, basic reverse engineering 101, and I'll let Josh do that. Cool. So, um, we'd like to start off with a quick reverse engineering 101. So, when you're reverse engineering executable binaries for uh, Flare on or CTF like challenges, you won't be given source code. And so, because of this, um, it's important to be able to read x86, x64, and R assembly. Uh, as the binary you'll be analyzing, especially if it's for a CTF, uh, will most likely be, have been built for one of these three architectures. And so if you have this binary and you want to understand it, so typically you need to be able to read the disassembly. And to do this, you need a disassembler. And uh, Blaine and I recommend using a program called IDA, um, which comes with uh, a disassembler as well as a debugger. And if you purchase the hex rays um, option, it also comes with the decompiler, which for the most part works pretty well. Um, sometimes it doesn't decompile code correctly, but in most cases it, it does uh, work pretty well. And the 
Yes, there are other tools out there that you can use, such as Radar 2 and Mopper, but Ida is by far the most advanced and full feature um, out of the, all, all the options that you have. And uh, so when you're, when you're analyzing something in Ida, um, you can employ different analysis strategies. And we've grouped these strategies into two categories. The first category we like to call top-down, and the second category we like to call bottom-up. Um, additionally, when you're reversing, you want to use a healthy dose of both static and dynamic analysis typically, and that's something we'll mention in upcoming slides. So uh, for analysis, analysis strategies, um, as we mentioned in the last slide, we have both a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. So a top-down approach would be, for example, starting at the beginning of the function that you want to analyze and working your way down from there, following the flow of execution to understand what the program does. And on the other side, we have bottom-up. And so with the bottom-up uh, reversing strategy, you find an interesting code block. For example, if it's for a CTF binary, if there's a win function that you need to reach, you would start there and work your way backwards from there to see how you can direct the flow of execution to hit that win function. And so when you're doing this, you want to uh, try to figure out what conditions you need to satisfy in order to reach that interesting code block um, and perhaps what values you can input that will influence the flow of execution in the way that will lead you to that win function. <coughs> Additionally, uh, sometimes it helps to use a debugger to see how input affects the output and the overall flow of execution, but that's something we'll go more in depth on um, in the upcoming slides. Uh, additionally, we can further group our reversing strategies into light and deep stack analysis and also light and deep dynamic analysis. So some examples of light stack analysis include running strings or viewing the imports um, that the binary uses, or viewing the resources of it, or perhaps even checking the entropy of the binary to see if maybe it's employing a packer. And packing is something we'll talk about towards the end of this presentation. Um, some examples of deep stack analysis include like we mentioned before, opening the binary up in a disassembler such as IDA Pro and viewing the disassembly, and in doing so, also you know, labeling functions once you figure out what function does, as well as defining struts um, or labeling just code and data, just any, anything that will help you to best derive the functionality of the binary. So for light and deep dynamic analysis, um, some examples of, of uh, light dynamic analysis would just be running the executable normally. Um, of course, in the sandbox VM case, it is malicious. Um, just observing the general behavior, you know, does it pop up a message box? Does it drop a file to your, to your desktop folder? Um, you know, using tools like Procmon and Postgres Explorer can uh, help you do light dynamic analysis. And uh, for deep dynamic analysis, what you typically do is you run the executable with a debugger, like when debug attached, and set appropriate breakpoints um, to observe how different registers and values are affected by function calls and instructions. Uh, here we have um, a graphical view of what we like to call analysis feedback loop looks like. And so what that entails is just basically just switching between uh, doing stack analysis and then dynamic analysis and then going back to do more stack analysis and, and then uh, going back to do more dynamic analysis and vice versa, just continuing to do that. And an example of this would be if you're using a stack analysis approach by first opening a binary up in IDA and viewing the disassembly, perhaps using the top-down approach like we mentioned before, and then uh, if you see an interesting function call and you want to see what parameters are actually being passed into this function call when you actually run the binary, then you would switch to a dynamic analysis approach. And by that, I mean you would uh, run the binary in a debugger, set a breakpoint on that interesting function call, let the program run until it hits that breakpoint, 
and then you see what values are actually being passed into that function. Um, and then once you figure out, you know, once once you figure out what parameters are actually being passed into the function, you go, okay, now I understand what this function does, or what what input this function is taking in. And so then you would go back to your stat analysis approach, go back to IDA, and continue statically reversing it um, until you get maybe another interesting function that, that you want to learn more about. So you go switch back to the butter and you just go back and forth like this um, until you fully understand the program. Um, next, I'll hand it off to Dwayne to talk about P file format. All right, so now all you guys are reading. Uh, basic reverse engineers. So you got that under your belt. Uh, we're going to go talk about some concepts uh, that we think you should now know uh, that will really help you with reverse engineering that if you don't know ahead of time, you may spend a lot of time trying to figure out what it is and then have to do Google searches. Uh, it's just this to start with, I wish I had. So we're first going to start about the PE file format for uh, Windows executables. So on the left over here, I highlighted just the, the actual challenges that were Windows executables. The two of them in particular, challenge two and four, you can glean a lot of information just by looking at the file format by itself, even before diving into like static or dynamic analysis. So, well, how do you recognize if it's a PE file format? Uh, you know, Windows typically has that .exe extension, but if you actually want to know the file format, you want to know its file type. And typically, you can figure that out by looking for magic bytes uh, that typically come at the beginning of the file. So, if we take one of the challenges, do blocker. Uh, and look at the first few bytes uh, in a hex editor, you can notice the 4D5A or MC, and that's the giveaway to the PE file format. So the format itself is big. Um, you don't need to be intimately familiar with all the nitty gritty details unless you seriously want to become a uh, first engineer or a malware uh, analyst. But of those, uh, these are some of the most important parts of the PE file format. Imports, exports, uh, different sections, and maybe even sometimes same as DOS header. So, uh, imports, what that is, is whenever a binary needs functionality that doesn't contain, it's going to ask other other executables, like, hey, I need this functionality. So, I'm going to need to import this from you. And uh, at the opposite end, those binaries that give out functionality have exports. So, they said, here, you, you need this functionality. Let me give it to you. Uh, sections within the PE file format, kind of a uh, a, it's like a, different modules of functionality within within the in the binary that represent different things. So, for instance, you have code or text section. That's typically where the actual instructions get executed. You have different data sections, whether it be uh, global variables, initialized, uninitialized variables, and even in the resource sections. Uh, in the resource section, you can store all kinds of information: icons, images, other executables, almost anything you want. There's, there's many other sections. These are just some of the ones that really stick out when you're, when you're looking at a binary that you don't know. Uh, then we have the MS-DOS header, which is always there. And, uh, that's just there for backwards compatibility. <coughs> Josh will touch on that soon. So, so why do you want to look at a PE file format? Well, if you want to get kind of a warm fuzzy for what the binary does ahead of time without running that, you can look at its imports, because that's some of the behaviors or some of the you know, functionality it's going to need. So, here I've listed you know, just some some imports that a binary may want, and if, if you don't have a key now, you're not used to looking at these every day, you'd be like, okay, what does this tell me? Well, after you get used to looking at them a lot, you can start picking out like, oh, I know these functions may correspond to this function or to this behavior, or I know it has networking capabilities. So by combi combining different potential capabilities, you get a, a little feel of what the binary may actually do or how they behave. So in one of the challenges, the ones I highlighted here actually like, stuck out or stood out to me, and it's like, hmm, all right, you can enumerate the file system. It does some hashing. It does encryption. And if you look even further, in the resource section, there's actually a ransom node. So all these are pretty much indicators of some form of ransomware. I um, mean, the name kind of gives it away. So you know, I didn't have to run it, and I, I now know ahead of time potential behavior and kind of what to keep my uh, Keep an eye out for it as I'm actually assembling it or debugging uh, So, pass off to Josh real quick and tell you more about the MS DOS header. So, um, the MS DOS header is um, basically it contains relocation information, which allows multiple segments to be to be uh, loaded at arbitrary memory addresses. And so, 
what follows the MS-DOS header is typically the DOS stub program. And the sole purpose of this DOS stub program is simply to print out um, this program cannot be run in DOS mode um, if a 32-bit or 64-bit PE is being run in DOS mode. And uh, this DOS stub program actually doesn't exist in true 60-bit mode programs because they're meant to be run in DOS mode, and so there's no need to print out a message saying that it can't be run in DOS mode. So, if you want to run a DOS stub program on the normal 32-bit or 64-bit machine, uh, you'll need to run it using a program called debug.exe uh, inside a DOS box simulator. And that's exactly what we had to do for calendar. So, for challenge 8, uh, when you first open the program up in the hex editor, you can see an interesting message, which basically says this program cannot not be run in DOS mode, which is atypical. You know, it's a, it's a double negative. Um, so that gives you a hint as to how you should run Challenge 8. And uh, if you do run it in uh, DOS box, as we mentioned before, uh, the DOS stub prints out this message. This program cannot not be run in DOS mode. So here is an example of what a normal MS-DOS subcode um, section looks like. As you can see, all it does is it prints out the string, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, and immediately exits after that. And this is what we see um, for challenge 8. As you can see, it looks a little different than the... Uh, the normal MSOS subcode. In this subcode, what it's doing after printing out this unusual string is it's jumping to uh, some location. So, what's in this location? Well, um, as it turns out, it jumps to the actual 16 bit um, code that it executes. And so, after uh, there's some anti disassembly involved, so after you take care of that, um, if you open that up um, in the graph view, that is what you get um, in IDA. And uh, from here, our job is to analyze the real 16 bit code. Uh, next, I'll hand it off to Blaine to talk about basic support and coding. All right. So, base 64, uh, it was used not too heavily for the challenge, but it was, it was used, you know, challenge one, eight, nine, and the question was why, why base 64 and why emphasize it? Well, base 64 allows you to transfer binary data over nine non-binary protocols. So, for instance, you can you can send data over just a get request, maybe jump it up, or you know, you can text your friend Mauer if you want to. Do. And the reason Mauer likes to use Base64 encoding is because it, it allows it to you know, get over these well-known protocols and send stuff like, like uh, maybe an XFIL or new commands or even get an X-stage payload. Um, other good uses for it is just a very simple screen clean of obfuscation from the human end. Uh, oftentimes it's used in like a PowerShell uh, like command. It's just very easy to encode your command and uh, not be able to recognize it. But there's also tools that can easily you know, rec recognize Base64 and Base64 decoder for you. Uh, so now the question is, if you're given a binary, how do you know if it's using basic 64 encoding? Wow. So basic 64 encoding is essentially just a substitution cipher, and you need some type of alphabet in order to uh, swap out the data you're putting in to get your, your, your output. And if you see this, this string right here highlighted red within the binary in the strings section, it's a good telltale sign that it's going to use basic 64 encoding. So, real quick, these are the actual internals of basic 64 encoding. I'm not going to go too in depth. Uh, the basics is it's about to chunk up the input data. For every three chunks, you can get out four chunks of output. Uh, those are just going to be indexes into the alphabet. So, in challenge one, uh, if you look at the string section, uh, you might notice a base64 input string. You can tell it's base64 encoded because it uses all the characters from the alphabet. But if you try to put it in a decoder, uh, maybe using like an online tool or writing out a script, you get all gibberish, then you're stuck with like, okay, I don't know what's going on, I'm going to have to uh, 
dig, dig further into the binary. Uh, but if you get used to seeing the base 64 encoding alphabet, uh, you know, you may not see it directly in the strings, but instead you may see one that looks very similar to it. And so you can actually have a, a custom alphabet of whatever you want. And so for challenge one, this was actually their custom alphabet. So if you use the typical one, you decode that, you're going to get garbage. If you use the custom alphabet, you're going to get out the correct answer. Um, and there's some online tools as well that allow you just to provide a custom alphabet. So a very simple technique, and I mean, it'll easily thwart tools that auto base to decode stuff. Yeah, uh, it's good to know. Uh, all right, so as an example for real world, and instead of just a CTF challenge, uh, I'm going to introduce a piece of malware called Minitube. Uh, it's written by a group called uh, APT29, suspected Russian group. Uh, what this piece of malware will do, once it gets on your box, it'll do a quick system survey. It'll assign, assign a unique victim ID, the country codes, uh, AV list, etc. concatenate all those values with a, a pipe symbol. And then we'll base 64 and put that data and ship it on the wire back to this command control node. And so if you're, if you're looking at a lot of PCAP data, you might see something like this come across. And over HTTP, uh, basic forward coding is used heavily, so this may not actually stick out to you. But if you have some sort of basic forward decoder, you can actually decode it and get out the data it's, it's sending out. All right. So now we've covered base 64. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about simple encryption. So encryption was employed uh, quite heavily throughout the challenge. Not too terribly complicated. We want to call it simple encryption. Uh, the main forms of encryption used were uh, XOR and uh, RC4. So whenever you do XOR encryption, it's a simple uh, symmetric form of encryption. You have the same key that can encrypt something, the same key can decrypt something. The key can be one or more bytes. Uh, RC4 is a little step up. It'll take a key, it'll generate what's called a key stream, and then use that key stream to then uh, XOR under the hood and all your data. And uh, the cool thing about a key stream is that you can take arbitrarily data. So your key doesn't have to be the long or, or uh, in the stream type. So if you're not familiar with XOR or exclusive OR, you actually are. It's kind of like the English definition of OR. You can go to a restaurant and you can get chips and fries, but now both. And on the left over here is just a truth table to show you the various inputs you put in and the outputs you can expect to get out. Uh, on the bottom left, just, uh, some, just quick examples like anything, x with anything gives you zero. Anything x with zero gives you anything. Uh, anything x with with random data, x with with anything again, all the anything is cancel out, and you're just left with your uh, random data that you put in. So to show you more of a uh, key uh, plain text and ciphertext form, you put in your key, XOR with your plain text, you get out your cipher text with your encoded data. Uh, same thing is true, symmetric, so you can put your key in, symmetric, or your, your cipher text, and you get out your plain text. And now our authors just love to use this, it's just a native instruction. Uh, you can encode URL data, constants, uh, strings, anything. They use it all the time. But it does have some drawbacks. Uh, you, can, you can pretty much brute force it if the key is short. And it's also subject to you know, plain text attacks, as well as uh, I'm going to call it the inverse algorithm. So if you have an algorithm that relies on XOR, you can just write the opposite of the algorithm and undo the ciphertext pretty easily. And we have a quick example of this. The, so all throughout the CTF that we did the flare on, they use a lot of algorithms that you know, really harped on RC4, but a lot of layered algorithms as well. So for each layer, you have to write an inverse of, of that that algorithm, and so you can undo the next layer, undo, et cetera, et cetera. So here's, an, here's an example from challenge eight. Uh, so for this, this is a, a rolling XOR algorithm. At the top, we have our plain text, hello world. It starts with a one byte key, so C5. Uh, the way it works is it'll XOR with that first byte, and it'll take that, uh, that byte uh, after it's been encoded, and use that to encode the next byte, and so on and so forth, and you just like roll the pattern, right? It's at the bottom of our cipher text. So if you know how to write the inverse of that algorithm, uh, you know that you can take the second to last byte in XOR, the last byte you get the plain text, one byte back, and XOR the next, etc. So you've unrolled it all the way, and then you just need to know the, the starting key byte, uh, starting key byte, yeah, to get the actual plain text back out. So we need to do this all the time throughout the CPF. But you will typically often do this in the real world for malware to undo maybe uh, communications go around the wire. You know, so as long as you know the key, you can undo that. 
undo the algorithm, or if you want to like undo the recode and reload, all kinds of stuff. Okay. So now I'm going to just briefly touch on RC4. I'm not going to get too in-depth in it. Uh, the two main portions to look out for are the uh, key scheduling algorithm and the pseudo-random generation algorithm. So for the uh, key scheduling algorithm, uh, what that's going to do is it's going to uh, allocate an array that's going to be 256 uh, bytes long. It's going to contain all 0, 0, 3, uh, FF. And then it's going to swap those based on the key that you put in. And that's going to be your, your, your S box. And so uh, under the hood, when you're actually looking at it from just a, just a simpler view, the, the key takeaways are to look for uh, a counter that gets initialized to uh, 100 hex, and then watching it fill that uh, that byte array up from 0, 0 sequentially all the way through FF. That's like the first telltale sign. Then if you start seeing lots of swaps going on uh, based on some value, then yeah, okay, now we've got S box initialization. And then later, if you see more swaps going on, that's the P PRGA, which every time you call that, it'll, it'll retrieve one a, a, a value from the S box and then mix it up some more. And that's the value that we use to integrate your data. So, yeah. Under the hood, these are what you can look for. If you see these, you can just go, aha, we got RC4. I'm going to spend too much more time on it. All right, now let's dive into some hashes. Uh, hashes were used quite a bit throughout the challenge. Um, and they were used for all kinds of various purposes, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about in this in a moment. So if you're not familiar with, with what a hash is, uh, it's essentially just a one-way function where you put in arbitrary length data and get out a fixed length output. Um, uh, hashes usually have the, the property where two things going into the function should not collide and hash to the same thing. So the typical hashes used are like MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-512, there's also some custom ones that malware authors like to use, or the boy called like 413. So again, how do you recognize these, these hash functions? Uh, a lot of times the malware will just uh, import this functionality, but sometimes it can have these functions statically compiled in. And when you see one of these uh, under the hood, the call graph is very long. And if you spend a lot of time on it, you're just going to hit your head on it. No idea. It's a lot of mathematical operations. Uh, Key giveaway for, for these functions are uh, typically at the beginning you'll see what are called initialization constants. And these are these are static for all the hash functions. So, uh, these are you know like I don't want to say cryptographic, cryptographic improvement, but you know smart people work on it, so don't change these values. Uh, so they're always going to be static. And you can just do a quick Google search on them, and it will come up with whatever hash function it is using. So uh, again, I'm going to pull many people back out, and it was actually statically compiled with SHA-1, and if you didn't know what it was, again, you spent a lot of time on it, but from here it's just easy to recognize that it matches the SHA-1 uh, initialization constants. And there's other constants like round constants, because the hashes go through a lot of different rounds, uh, etc. But since malware authors know that you can easily try to figure these, these functions out, they try to sometimes hide these constants. Uh, ways they can do that is maybe taking the, the inverse of the constant, uh, two stop or even or uh, even since it's just like an integer, they split it up in multiple parts, combine it right before use, and you do a lot more hard times so you can't move to it. Uh, in challenge 5, actually, they had a modified MD5, where they took the leftmost symbol and they just shifted it down some. So, if you, again, you did a simple Google search, so when I recognize it's MD5. All right, so I mentioned ROR13. Uh, what is ROR13? It's a little uh, hashing algorithm where you put in a string, and ROR meaning rotate right and rotate uh, this round. 13 to the right, and you just keep uh, summing them up over and over until you get this final hash, which is a 32-bit integer. So why do malware authors like to use this? Well, instead of carrying around all these strings, which are very long, you can represent these strings with just a small 32-bit you know, keyword. So uh, besides just you know uh, not taking as much space, we'll typically, instead of importing the functionality, we'll dynamically import the functionality. And to do so, they'll scan through the loaded modules or loaded DLLs, uh, and looking at the names, hash each name, and comparing it to the hash it's looking for. Once it, once it finds a matching hash, it's like, aha, I found the DLL I'm looking for. Now I need to scan through its exports and try to find, uh, I'll hash each export name and try to match it with my own hashes. So, as a reverser, what you'll have to do is then re implement the algorithm. In this case, Word 13 is pretty canned. Uh, there's a lot of scripts out there that you can go through and uh, you know pre-generate a list of like known hashes from different DLLs and exports and just auto match them up. But if they're using a custom hash hashing algorithm besides Word 13, you don't have to make your own. 
It's not hard to do. Nice little iPad to do. Alright, so what else can we use hashes for? Uh, well, typically they can be used to verify a key or like a password. Uh, you know, passwords can be hashed and stored in a database. That way your password is nice to store, just a hash representation of it. Uh, and, you know, if, a, if, a, if an attacker ever dumps that database, they'll need to try to force those passwords. You know, keep putting input until they find a, either a collision or the actual password. So for challenge seven, we actually had to brute force a triple shot, uh, essentially email address. But luckily for us, we were able to uh, narrow down the key space and divide it up into six characters in length, and then we knew all the possible possible values of those characters could be. So it made brute forcing not too terrible. Uh, other uses? Well, if malware is position independent, it doesn't contain the relocations. Uh, they can actually check their code and make sure it hasn't been modified. So a lot of times when you debug, uh, well, if you use software breakpoints, it'll actually replace some of the bytes with uh, uh, 0xcc, which is just an interrupt for the debugger. And so if you hash your own code section, notice that it doesn't match the known hash, then you can tell you're being bugged uh, through other functionality. So uh, lastly, you can also use it for some anti-analysis. Uh, it's kind of like when you're checking for your modification. Uh, Power Duke, it's in the same family as Mini Duke. Uh, what, what they'll do, they'll actually check the file name link to known hash links, uh, which is fun, interesting. Uh, a lot of times now we're Analyst or reverse engineers will name a binary its own hash name, whether it be the MD5 or SHA1 hash, just so you can keep track of it. And it doesn't have an extension, so it won't run by accident. Uh, but the actors you know, know that, so by checking it and seeing, checking their file name, if it matches the hash link, they'll just fail because they know they're on for an analysis of All right, I'm going to hand it off to Josh to take over the anti analysis for it. Okay. So, uh, as you can see, a couple challenges in the Flareon challenge um, did include anti-analysis and obfuscation. So, uh, anti-analysis techniques um, are employed by malware authors to basically for analysts. And so, uh, some examples of these include anti-disassembly, anti-debugging checks, anti-VM checks, and obfuscation. And in response, to these anti-analysis techniques. Analysts employ their own methods to bypass those anti-analysis techniques. So you can kind of think of it as like an anti-anti-analysis technique. <laughs> uh, so first anti-analysis technique we'll talk about is obfuscation. So obfuscation is a technique employed by malware authors to make the actual code of the binary difficult to read. And doing this slows the malware analyst down, which in turn maximizes the time that their malware can potentially be used without being fully reversed and understood. And uh, obfuscation comes in many forms, and one such form is JavaScript obfuscation. Um, in, an example of this can be seen in the Angular exploit kit, um, which is a real-world example of malware that uses multiple layers of complex code obfuscation in order to hide um, the actual exploits it runs. So in challenge 10 of this year's uh, Flareon challenge, uh, the first part of it was actually based on the Angular exploit kit. And uh, the landing page of challenge 10 is what is shown here on the right. And so when you open it up in the browser, it just looks like that. And obviously, it just looks like garbage, right? Um, well, it gets even worse when you view the source code, which is on the left. Um, it's just a bunch of nonsense that doesn't seem to make any sense at first. Uh, and this is just another example of just strange JavaScript, uh, obfuscated JavaScript um, in the first screenshot. Uh, but fortunately, uh, there are actually many browser developer tools that are useful for analyzing and debugging this obfuscated JavaScript. Um, some examples include Firebud, or I use DevTool, or Chrome's Debug Console. And uh, these tools can actually be used uh, to decode uh, what you see uh, in, in the first screen try. Um, if for some reason those tools fail, you can always resort to manual decoding, um, which is a more arduous process um, so if you can, recommend using one of the dev tools um, that I just mentioned. 
And uh, when you properly decode those strings in the first screen shot, you, you see, uh, uh, you get what you see in the second screen shot. So packers, um, uh, packers are programs that compress the original binary, making the original code unreadable. And some common examples of packers are PX, ASPack, and TUI. And to identify the use of a packer, you can use existing tools like PID, or just run strings on the binary to see if there's any traces of uh, the name of the packer that perhaps the binary was using. Um, another sign that you can look for is a severe lack of imports. That could also be a sign that a packer's been used. Um, additionally, you could also see if there's if the file that you're analyzing is associated with unusually high entropy. That could be another sign that this binary that you're looking at is packed. Um, additionally, you can see if uh, there if you if you observe that code is being executed in a new memory segment. That could also be another um, sign that packs could use. Um, so to deal with packed binaries, you can either use an unpacking tool, or uh, you can manually unpack it. Uh, in the screenshot, you can see um, that we have a UPX pack binary. This is actually from last year's Flow and Challenge. Um, and so to unpack it, you can simply use the UPX program to unpack it. Um, but this doesn't always work. Um, sometimes this tool fails to properly unpack the UPX pack binary. And if that's the case, you can actually manually unpack UPX binaries pretty easily. Um, there's lots of tutorials and guides online for how to do that. Um, so before we discuss packers in the context of Challenge 8 with Learn Challenge, um, let's talk about first uh, how packing stuff works. So a packing stub is basically a stub of code that is used to decode code that has been compressed or encoded. And uh, so oftentimes, uh, malware will malloc space for the unpacked code, and then either copy the packed code there and decode it there, or it will unpack the, um, the packed code wherever it is in memory, and then uh, you know copy the newly unpacked code to the newly malloc space. And so, as you can see in the slide, Challenge Eight also used the packing stub to decode its actual code, and all it did was add a value to every word starting at a certain address, or hex 70 iterations. And when it finally finishes, um, you get what you see on the right. So, uh, anti-disassembly. Anti-disassembly is another trick that was employed by Challenge 8. Um, that was designed to make reversing it more difficult. And there's a couple ways you can go about employing anti-disassembly. Um, for example, you can add extra bytes to trick the disassembler into disassembling at the wrong offset. Or you can add data directly into the code or text section where data isn't supposed to be. Or you can jump into the middle of another instruction, which will also mess the disassembler up. Um, here is an example of a fake call being employed. Uh, that basically throws the disassembler off. If you look on the right, um, the, the uh, E8 that you see, opcode is, is associated with the call construction. Um, and uh, also, you'll notice that the plus one is unusual um, to see in, in uh, instruction. So that also gets in the way. And uh, to fix it, you can easily do this in IDA. Um, all you need to do is convert that fake call instruction. Um, you need to convert it to data instead of code. And so in IDA, all you would do is just click on the call instruction and press the DE, and that turns that code, which is, uh, which is, which is not actually code, into data. And once you do that, you get what you see on the right. So uh, let's talk about uh, tricking the flow oriented disassemblers. So there's different disassembly algorithms. 
Uh, most commercial disassemblers, such as IDA, will use the flow-oriented disassembly algorithm, and so that's what we'll talk about today. Um, there are certain assumptions and choices that have to be made about which location you need to, or the disassembler needs to disassemble first when it encounters a conditional jump or a call. Um, for calls, uh, most slow-oriented disassemblers will process the bytes immediately after the call first and disassemble those bytes. Um, for conditional branches, most slow-oriented disassemblers will process the false branch first. And malware authors can abuse um, can, be, can, can be use this behavior by having a conditional jump after a condition that they know will always be true um, and arrange the bytes such that the instructions that are disassembled in the false branch conflict with the bytes that are disassembled when the branch is not taken. Um, so, as we mentioned in the last slide, uh, when the flow-oriented disassembler encounters a call instruction, it will always dis dis disassemble the bytes immediately following the call instruction first before disassembling uh, the target of the call. And so when it does this, as you can see, um, it, does, it doesn't disassemble correctly. Um, it thinks that the bytes associated with hello are actual code, but it's, it's not. It's, it's data for the string hello. Um, and so again, to fix this, all you need to do is convert the uh, bytes immediately following the call to data. Um, again, using the D key in IDA. And when you do this, um, you're able to correctly disassemble um, this, these bytes, which you can see on the bottom right. Sure. Um, how do you identify that there is a, some instructions Although they have to be data section, uh, is there any, you know, depending on your experience, is there any easier way to identify? Because, you know, going step by step, tracking all the flow, if the binary is large, it's going to be too complicated to identify the section is actually messing up the whole thing, you know, disassembly process. So, what do you, what do you guys have then? So, uh, so, the easiest way, not in, in an automated fashion, actually, but just visually what you're looking at. Anytime you see a jump or a call that has the plus offset, that's the key giveaway that somehow I just messed up. Um, either that or someone is trying to force I to mess up to disassemble the unit at the wrong offset. Um, another way is like, for instance, in, in this side of the job today, uh, we're pulling out many new again. They actually do employ the, the technical embedding data directly within the code. Uh, so here I fixed it up. So you can easily see the string that's being followed by each call. Obviously, when you first look at it, it's completely messed up and it's horrible. Uh, but if you run uh, strings within IDA, you can specify look everywhere within the binary. And these will stick out, so you can go from each string, work your way back, um, and try to redefine those strings. Now, sometimes even IDA will not tell you a string as a string. It's a code section. Honestly, it gets really tricky, you know, which is why they employ these techniques. Uh, I guess in the end, you could wind up writing your own script, you know, parse through it. Uh, you can find all potential streams, whether in the code section or not, and then you can record it as a call. So in, in, in general, it's managed to visual very Um So Blaine already addressed the slide, basically. Um, you know, you can see the similar, the, the same technique being employed in real world malware uh, in Duke. So you see data, um, or, or uh, streams are directly being embedded into the code section, which is not typical of behavior for uh, for uh, normal P programs. And uh, interestingly, later samples of many do XOR encrypt these streams to make this technique less obvious to detect. Um, but that's also something we can deal with as analysts, um, just requires a little bit more. So anti-debugging checks. Um, these are basically checks to determine whether a binary is being run in the VM or not. If malware detects that it is being run in the VM, it will usually try to hide some functionality um, or behave in a different way than it normally would if it weren't being run in the VM, just to make 
it more difficult for reverse engineers to fully understand what the program actually does when not being led. Yeah. And uh, some common Win API debugger checking functions include is debugger present, uh, and also anti query information process, and some common structures that are manually checked include the process heap flag and the anti global flag. It's actually uh, pretty easy for the most part to deal with most anti debugging checks. Um, especially if you have IDA, there's a uh, extension called IDA Stealth, which makes it simple as checking some options um, to basically nullify most of these anti-debugging checks. Um, however, uh, it's also possible to do it manually, although that's, a, uh, again, anything manual is, is more arduous, right? Um, but you could do it, like, you could set a breakpoint on a call to the debugger present, and then uh, Immediately after it returns from that function call, you would set the value of the AX to zero if it returns one. And it is so you can also do it manually as well. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Blaine for a conclusion. All right. So uh, throughout today's talk, we pretty much have talked about some of the basic reverse engineering concepts that we. We not only saw it learned throughout the flare on, but are, are good to share with people who are interested in uh, reverse engineering or malware analysis. And uh, these concepts are pretty fundamental. And so once you once you know them and you get used to seeing them, the speed at which you can reverse uh, is greatly increased. Um, now there's there's a lot of other topics and, and great tricks, and we can, uh, tips we can give, but we have so much time. Uh, like, how we define structures within IDA, maybe like how to write I, I, Python script, utilizing some knowledge and knowledge analysis to help you get code flow coverage. Uh, that'd be another talk, I guess. But the general takeaway is do CTS, especially for some of power ones, uh, related, mainly because you can read all day the blog posts about certain techniques, but it's always good to get that muscle memory of actually doing. And a lot of the times, you only know the techniques employed based off of your experience. So if you only analyze a very narrow subset of malware that only employs certain techniques, you won't be very knowledgeable of other techniques that are out there. So by doing CTS, you can get a you know, very broad view of, of all kinds of techniques employed in a very short amount of time. Um, just kind of talk, you know, to show that there's, there's plenty of other stuff we could have talked about, but we just wanted to focus on some of the more core concepts. And certain concepts, uh, towards the left or to the right, they, they make it more, much more difficult. Uh, especially if it's like an unknown format, like a go button. Or an uh, unknown word. Less out than you. Alright, and with that, any um, questions? Uh, so my question being is, uh, how long would you say a decode, like, how long is to decode as far as, like, GPU or CPU, how long does it cra need to crack, uh, I guess even, not decode, but, you know, passwords, et cetera, oh, so you or, like, hashing? So, like, brute force, like... Yeah, out of how long does it take brute force? Uh, that depends on the hash you use. Uh, so, for instance, like, MD5 is broken. And so you can, you can actually do like MD5 reverse lookups. You can provide an MD5 hash to some online site so they can just spit you out a word that will match that hash. It may not be the word you're looking for, but it'll hash the same thing. And uh, I guess in the recent days, you know, SHA ones, then I just smashed it up a little bit. Um, I'm not an expert on weaker, like strong solutions, so I'll, I'll try to talk on that. But yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, oh, sorry, real quick. So yeah, MD5, you can easily break it. Uh, other times, the, the other ones are going to take much longer. You can employ Rainbow to help speed this up. Like, yeah, uh, I've done that before, yeah. You know, like, like pre, kind of like pre-hash values, you can work them up much quicker. Uh, other times, it's going to like, fire up John the Ripper and then let her rip on the yeah. GPU. Yeah, yeah. tight index. <laughs> um, actually, also for, uh, there was a challenge where we had to write a script to enforce um, like with a triple um, yeah. hash, uh, hash, but we were able to reduce the key space yeah. so that it took only just for me it took a couple hours. Yeah. Did you say how PID identifies the packer that was used? Is that from the pack the packing stuff? That you uh, so yeah, essentially you know PID uses like proprietary uh, I guess signature to look for these. So it's, I would assume it's be great. Similar to like the R signature, and I think people have tried to port uh, PID or the R signature. So I guess people, uh, 
I guess, the variety of series of these typical packages. Uh, and that's, that's how it tries to be the term package. So sometimes there, there, we end up with a, so most of the time we end up with a Windows API code. And uh, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of Windows APIs, and some of them are not well documented, you know. So do you have a good, I don't know, maybe a plugin or maybe a resource to quickly identify the, what kind of parameters this, this function is taking so I can you know, better understand this function to you know, yeah, so uh, there's there's a great tool out there called the API Monitor. Uh, I don't know if you've ever used it. Uh, it has literally thousands of APIs that it can hook. Uh, so that way, uh, when you run your binary, you can see like, at, at each of these functions that it's looking at, you can see the input as well as the output. Uh, the hard part is getting it right and fine tuning it. Because you want to hook all thousands of the data overload. You need to fine tune the ones you're actually like, interested in. Uh, a lot of times, now related to anything we're dealing with. Like, Allocate virtual memory, writing script functions, stuff like that. So I would go with the API monitor. That's just a little bit. We're not earlier on. I'm sorry, it's not directly related to that. So assume that we're analyzing. I, I believe that you're also working on kind of uh, current investigation on that and that's the modern one. So, um, one of the biggest challenges that we are facing is we have the ability to understand which process is creating a connection on an operating system. It's easy to trace. But unfortunately, in UDP, it's really hard to find which process is exactly creating this request. I um, mean, this DNS query, for example. And uh, is there any way that you can, you know, I checked out the Windows NetMon. It's a tool to trace the which process is creating the UDP request. But unfortunately, if you are sending a DNS request, it's actually system exit is the creator of this request. So I need to know which exactly process in that thing. Uh, so, in my head, I don't know if there's a tool to manage the process here. There's tools to trace the DNS uh, about the things? Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe Feather might, might be able to tell you. No. Actually, those two are good tools, so you monitor to whether there's a DNS query yeah. or maybe Wireshark. It tells you that there's something asking for the DNS, so you can find the command and control center of the malware. But uh, since we are investigating a batch with you know hundreds of Process is running. I can't identify which process is creating those DNS request, so I can, you know, focus on that thing. So I mean, you can always try to write your own custom kernel driver. Yeah, that, that seems to the, the, the like that part of the stack. Uh, so that's a lot of work. Because I was thinking, Windows is a lot of things. So maybe not that easy. That was really easy. Maybe. I don't know. I, I think that's about all yeah. the time. Yeah. If you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, come up to us. Uh, that's what the book says. Oh, okay. the yeah. And that I wrote in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.